Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing finite dimensional vector spaces. Okay, so we've now seen uh, the definition of what the dimension of a vector space is. What I want to do in this video is turn my attention to trying to understand how these concepts of dimension interplay with subspaces, okay? Uh, because there's a number of interesting uh, results uh, concerning subspaces. So firstly then, as a warm-up, I'll just remind you of what is actually meant by a subspace. So let's say we're going to have a subspace, capital W, which is going to be a subspace of my vector space, capital V. Okay, so in picture form, let's have my uh, s vector space capital V drawn out here. Okay, and I'll denote my entire vector space in red here. So this is the set of all vectors in my vector space capital V here. And now, first and foremost, the, a subspace then of a vector space is a subset of the set that underlies the vector space. So I'll mark this on here. So let's say that this sub-portion here uh, is capital W as a subset of vectors of the vector space capital V. Now, a subspace has to be a very special subset of the vector space capital V because it, with the inherited composition laws of addition and um, scalar multiplication over the field capital F on it from the larger vector space, has to be a vector space in its own right to classify, uh, well, to um, make the grade to actually be considered a subspace. Okay, so let me just uh, go over exactly what this means. So if we have our addition composition table for the entire vector space here, okay, and of course this will tell us what any two vectors in the entire vector space added together is equal to. Now I'm going to restrict this down to the subset capital W. Okay, and what that means is I'm now only interested in adding two elements of W together. Okay, so let's restrict down and let's say that these rows of the addition composition table here correspond to the elements of W and these columns of the addition composition table here correspond to the elements of this uh, subset W. Okay, I am therefore only interested in this little square of my addition composition table which tells me what any element of W added to any other element of W is actually going to be equal to. Okay, so that's what I mean by the inherited or restricted addition law on W. Okay, similarly we can do the same for scalar multiplication, so let's have scalar multiplication here. Now we don't restrict the field at all, the subspace W will still be a vector space over the field, capital F, so the field remains unchanged. But we are going to restrict how many vectors we are actually interested in, elements of the field multiplying. Okay, so of course this scalar multiplication table tells us what any element of the field scalar multiplied by any vector in the vector space is equal to. Okay, but I'm not interested in any vector in the vector space, I'm only interested in those vectors that are in my subspace W. Okay, so I'm only going to be interested in any element of the field multiplied by any element of W, so of course I'm only interested in this sub-portion of the multiplication table here. Okay, so that is the restricted scalar multiplication law. So if this subset, capital W, with these two restricted addition and scalar multiplication laws on it, actually satisfies the axioms of being a vector space over the field capital F in its own right, uh, then we call it a subspace of the vector space capital V. Okay, so it could exist perfectly well on its own and it would be a perfectly good vector space over the field F. Okay, so that's the concept of a subspace, okay? So now what we want to see is how does the concepts of dimension that we've been exploring in previous videos actually interact with this concept of a subspace? Okay, so the first thing that we want to address is if it's the case that our larger vector space, capital V, is a finite dimensional vector space, is it then always the case that a subspace of the vector space, capital V, is a finite dimensional vector space? So we are now saying that this vector space, capital V, is a finite dimensional vector space, which I'll just abbreviate as FDVS, okay? What I now want to ask is, 
Is it then going to be the case that capital W is a finite dimensional vector space? Okay, and the answer is surely, of course it is. Okay, intuitively it should be. Uh, but how are we going to prove it? And proving it isn't actually quite as trivial as you would think. I mean, it's not difficult, but it's not quite as trivial as you would think. Okay, so indeed, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to Firstly, just explore the concept of dimension in a little bit more detail. We're going to have to have a few more little theorems before we can actually uh, prove that if uh, the vector space capital V is a finite dimensional vector space, and if W is a subspace of capital V, then W is also a finite dimensional vector space. Okay, so, uh, the first theorem then that I want to look at, which is going to help us prove this, uh, concerns the size of any linearly independent set uh, of vectors of my vector space capital V. So, we've seen already in this video that if you have a linearly, sorry, a linearly independent set of vectors, capital L, that the order of that linearly independent set of vectors is always less than or equal to the order of a set of vectors which spans the vector space. Okay, so this is something that we spent ages proving. Okay, now what I want to do is update this um, theorem a little bit. Okay, and the reason I can update it is that we've now defined what is actually meant by the dimension of a vector space. And remember the dimension of a vector space capital V was equal to the order of any basis of that vector space, so the order of a basis. Now a basis spans the entire vector space. Remember a basis is a set of vectors which is both linearly independent and spans the entire vector space. So I could put in here any basis as my set that spans the entire vector space. So I now know that the order of any linearly independent set in my vector space capital V is less than or equal to the order of some basis. But the order of some basis is the dimension of V. So this now tells me that the order of any linearly independent set in my vector space capital V is less than or equal to the dimension of V. Okay, and that's going to be really, really important. So if you have a linearly independent set of vectors in your vector space capital V, its order, the number of vectors that is actually in that, must be less than or equal to the dimension of V. Okay, and we're actually going to use this now to prove another theorem. So that's my first beautiful result, and I think I'll actually even box this rather than just underlining it. This is really, really important, so I'll box it in green there. Okay, so... What I now want to show you then is that you can extend a linearly independent set always to form a basis of the vector space capital V. And you might be saying, well, this looks a bit uh, far removed from what we were actually trying to do here, but it is going to be really important what we're looking at here. Okay, and they're interesting theorems in their own right. They're very, very important and useful theorems. Okay, so uh, what I showed you earlier then is that if you have a spanning set uh, of a vector space, a set that's, uh, of vectors which spans the entire vector space, that you can always reduce it uh, down into a basis in a finite dimensional vector space. Okay, uh, what I now want to show you is that if you've got any linearly independent set of vectors in your vector space, you can always um, put more vectors into it, build it up into a basis for that vector space. Okay, so uh, let's say that L is a set of linearly independent vectors of my vector space capital V. Okay, so we'll have V1, V2, all the way up to Vn. Okay, and it's linearly independent. Okay, so these are all vectors within my vector space capital V, and I want to stress that we're not talking about subspaces at the moment. We've gone back just to talking about a vector space. Okay, so I'll draw a picture for this to make it absolutely concrete. I've got my vector space here, capital V. Okay, and all of these vectors, V1, V2, all the way up to Vn, these are all elements of my vector space. So V1, V2, and then we'll go all the way up to Vn here. Okay, now, this set, I'm assuming, is linearly independent. Now, what I want to show you is that I can take this up, I can add vectors into this to make it into a basis. Okay, and we're going to use this result that is boxed in green to do that. Okay, so, either this set actually spans the entire vector space, or it doesn't. 
if this set spans the entire vector space, so if the span of L is equal in, to the entire vector space, then we are done. It is a linearly independent set of vectors by initial assumption, and it now spans the entire vector space, and therefore it must actually equal a basis, and it must have size, the dimension of V. So little n would have to be the dimension of V, if that was going to be true. Okay? Or it doesn't. Okay, so if, if it spans the entire vector space, we're done. Easy. Uh, if it doesn't span the entire vector space, then we've got more of a job to do. Okay, so if it doesn't span the entire vector space, then what must that mean? That must mean that there are vectors in the vector space capital V which cannot be written as a linear combination of these vectors in the set capital L. Okay, so there must exist. Okay, and in fact, I'll put therefore. Okay, uh, so this is possibility one. Possibility two, then, is that the therefore must exist. Um, in fact, I should write out that span of L is not equal to V. Okay, so possibility one was that span of L was equal to V. Possibility two here was that span of L is not equal to V. Now, if possibility two is true, then therefore there must exist a little V, which is an element of capital V, such that little v um, is not an element of the span of L. Okay, So all that says is that if span of L isn't equal to v, then there must exist some vector in the vector space which actually isn't in the span of uh, L. Okay, Right, uh, so what I now claim is that if I construct a new set, okay, so if I construct a new set which I'll call L prime, which is going to contain v1, v2, all the way up to Vn, and now I'm going to add in this new element, V, okay? If I add in this new element which wasn't in the span of L, then my claim is that this is still linearly independent, okay? So my claim is that if you add in a vector that isn't in the span of your set L, uh, then the new set, which will be one bigger, is still linearly independent. Okay, now how can I prove this? Well, what is the definition of linearly independent? So the definition of linearly independent is that there is only one linear combination of these uh, vectors which will actually give the zero vector. So let's write this out. So the only way that C1 times V1 plus C2 times V2 plus all the way up to Cn Vn plus Cn minus, not minus, plus 1 uh, times V will equal zero where this is the zero vector here, will be the trivial one, okay, i.e. where all of these um, scalars here, c1, c2, c3, all the way up to cn, cn plus 1, are equal to zero. Okay, so how am I going to prove that that is the only way this can possibly actually work? Well, we're going to do it by proof by contradiction. So let's assume that it isn't true. Okay, so let's assume that this isn't actually linearly independent. Okay, so what that would mean is that there is a non-trivial linear combination of these n plus 1 vectors which gives the zero vector. Okay, so what I now claim is that that would mean that you can prove that V was actually in the span of L. Okay, what you can actually do is write V as a linear combination of V1, V2, all the way up to Vn. Okay, and the reason for this is that if we do have a non-trivial linear combination of these n plus 1 vectors which gives the zero vector, I claim that one of the things that must be non-zero is that is this Cn plus 1. Okay, so I claim that if we have a non-trivial linear combination, Cn plus 1 here must not be equal to zero. Okay, now that's, um, firstly, I do need to give an argument for that, because remember, uh, in a non-trivial linear combination, all that we know is that some of the scalar coefficients are not equal to zero. We don't necessarily know that this specific one is not equal to zero, but in this case, we do know that it's specifically not equal to zero. Uh, quite simply, the argument for that is that if it was equal to zero, uh, then this term would vanish, basically, and then what you'd have is a non-trivial linear combination of these vectors v1, v2, all the way up to vn, which gave the zero vector. Okay, and some of these would be non-zero. And that is a contradiction because, of course, we assumed that the set L was linearly independent. Okay, so this one has to be non-zero, 
Otherwise, you'd have a non-trivial linear combination of the vectors v1, v2, all the way up to vn, which gave the zero vector. Okay, so this has to be non-zero. Now, what we know is that for a vector which um, has a non-zero uh, coefficient in this non-trivial linear combination, what it means is that we can rewrite this vector v as a linear combination of the rest. Okay, so what this implies, and we did this earlier on, is that you can rewrite v as a linear combination of the rest. So v will equal something of the form a1 v1 plus a2 v2 uh, plus all the way up to a n v n. Okay, so my claim is that if this isn't linearly independent, I can rewrite V as a linear combination of the rest, but that's a contradiction because I assumed that little V was not in the span of L. Okay, so hence this must have been linearly independent. So when you take a linearly independent set of vectors, add in another vector which is outside of its span, you still end up with a linearly independent set. Okay, now, what this then means is that you can continue this process until you end up with a set that spans the entire vector space. Okay, so this new set that you've got here, L prime, either this will span the entire vector space, and in that case it will be a basis, or there again is another vector in the vector space that's outside of the span of this set, and you can then add that other vector in and still remain linearly independent. And you can go on and on like this. And you might question, well, what's to stop you going on forever? Okay, it might be the case that you just continue adding more and more vectors in and never actually get to the point where the set spans the entire vector space. But here's where we come back to our equation green here. We know that the order of a linearly independent set is always less than or equal to the dimension of v, which is some finite number. Okay, so this curtails it. This says you can't go on forever, okay, because the order of a linearly independent set always has to be less than or equal to this finite number. So at some point then, the only other possibility is eventually you get to a point where it does span the entire set, and then it will be a basis Okay, so in fact we know exactly what that point will be where you actually get uh, to span the entire set. It'll be where you actually have the number of vectors equal to the dimension of V because we know that all bases have order the dimension of V. So basically what you can do with any linearly independent set is continue adding vectors in that are outside of the span of that linearly independent set until you have a number of vectors which is equal to the dimension of the vector space and then you will have reached the target, you will actually be a basis. Okay, so what I have just shown you then is that any linearly independent set of vectors can be extended to form a basis. Okay, and this is how we're going to prove that if the vector space capital V is a finite dimensional vector space, then the subspace capital W will also be a finite dimensional vector space. Okay, right, uh, so I think we'll have a little break here and we'll finish the proof in the next video.